All right, well, I got a word for us this morning. How many of you guys are ready to receive the word this morning? Amen. I got a word for you this morning. Uh, now, next week, uh, I've asked all of our leaders um, right now. No, I've, I've said something. I've asked all of our leaders to um, ask the Lord what the Lord is saying for our church and for our people here in 2024. Uh, and so I anticipate many of them will have words for us uh, and uh, what heaven is saying and what the season looks like in 2024. So you don't want to miss next week's service as we start to press into what does God have for us next. Amen. Uh, we're going to deal with what God has for us now, today. Um, and so, uh, believe it or not, it might seem very strange or odd, but I actually have a message revolving around Christmas. Is that, I know, I know, I know, I know. Just came out of left field, right? Uh, who would have thought? But I want to read the story to you. Uh, and so if you have your Bible with you, you can turn to Luke chapter 2 and follow along with the story of Christmas. Some of you guys have heard the story uh, before, but I want to give it to you in kind of with fresh eyes and a fresh perspective of what God is saying in this season for us. And I feel like it's going to impact uh, and help you encounter God more. Amen. Um, and now, so it starts in chapter two. We're just going to read this Christmas story. Now it happened in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus to register all the world's inhabitants. This was the first census taken by Quirinius, was governor of Syria. Everyone was traveling to be registered in his own city. Now Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the town of Nazareth to Judah, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was from the house and family of David. He went to register with Miriam, with Mary, who was engaged to him and was pregnant. But while they were there, some of you just found out today that her name is actually Miriam. That's how you pronounce it. Anyway, so didn't want to skip over that. But while they were there, the time came for her to give birth, and she gave birth to her firstborn son. She wrapped him in stripes of cloth and set him down in a manger, since there was no room for them in the inn. Now, verse 8, now there were shepherds in the same region living out in the fields and guarding their flock at night. Suddenly an angel of Adonai stood before them, and the glory of Adonai shone all around them, and they were absolutely terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I proclaim good news to you, which will be great joy to all the people. A Savior is born for you today in the city of David, who is Messiah the Lord. Now I find this interesting that he says the city of David and not just Bethlehem, I believe there's significance to that labeling. Don't forget that. Who is the Messiah, the Lord? And the sign to you is this. You will find an infant wrapped in stripes of cloth. Maybe you call them swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly a multitude of heavenly armies appeared with the Lord, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth shalom or peace to men of goodwill. And when the angels departed from them into the heavens, the shepherds were saying to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which Adonai has made known to us. So they hurried off. Someone say hurried. Hurried, hurried off and found Mary and Joseph, Miriam and Joseph, and the baby lying in the manger. And when they had seen this, they made known the word that had been spoken to them concerning this child. And all those who heard were amazed at the things the shepherds told them. But Miriam, or Mary, treasured all these things, pondering them in her hearts. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, just as they had been told. Now, in Matthew chapter 2, we, we hear a little bit more about this story. We hear about when he's born, it triggers uh, the, the celestial stars in the sky communicate to wise men or, or uh, magi that the king had been born, and they set out to travel and find him. Uh, many times we see the story like they traveled that night and saw him, uh, but I don't know if you know this, but they don't exactly have jets in this time period. So they wouldn't have got there quickly. It probably would have taken them maybe as long as what's suspected is two years. So they don't show up for Jesus till he's about a two-year-old, okay? Uh, he's a toddler at that point, most likely. 
All right, but I think there's some interesting things here that we can take and grow our faith with God if we will be a little bit more like the shepherds. So my assignment this morning is to get you to be more like these shepherds in the story. I think there's some things that we miss in the story that are remarkable for the way in which we live our lives and we worship our God. So I want you to notice something it says here. It says that angels of the Lord appeared to shepherds in the field. And when they did, let me, let me just get this clear. They didn't appear to the religious leaders in the temple. They didn't show up to the high priest. They didn't show up with the celebrity pastor. They didn't show up to the pastor with a platform to give the word. They showed up to the shepherds who were doing the job. See, sometimes I think we get kind of caught up in celebrity pastor status or celebrity leader status, and God is not so impressed with man all the time. Does that mean he doesn't use both? He uses both. But we have to get out of the mentality that I have no revelation inside of me if I don't have a platform to spread it. These are just shepherds in a field, but I want you to notice some things about what happens here. Is they are shepherds in a field, and remember what we said? We said they hurried up. Can I ask you a question that maybe you've never pondered? If these shepherds hurried after the angels showed up, I want you to picture this. Okay, We saw the kids, and they were holding their shepherd's staffs. And What happened to the sheep? It says that they were there guarding the sheep. Someone say guarding. Guarding means, and it implies that they need to be guarded. That there is some danger afoot. There is something there that they need protecting from. And these angels show up and the shepherds bounce. They're like, we got to go. You guys are on your own. It doesn't say that one shepherd said to the others, I'll stay, you go, and then we'll switch. I want you to hear me. I'll stay with the sheep and make sure they're okay because someone's got to go. There's not a conversation. There's just an instant act of obedience. Angels have showed up and said, the Messiah you have been praying for is somewhere and you need to get there. And they dropped everything. I want you to get this because Jesus, as he grows up, he teaches us this parable. He talks about the shepherd. And he talks about leaving the what? 99 to chase the one lost sheep down. And I think, see, there's something that's rooted in this story that gets us to that story. And see, what happens here is that the 99 are those sheep the shepherd leaves, but they don't go looking for the lost sheep. They go looking for these sheep. They leave the 99 to find the one, the Savior. See, he wasn't a lost sheep. He came for the lost sheep. Sheep wander through creation. The shepherds were seeking the wonder of creation. They were willing to leave the 99 to chase the one. See, they were tasked with guarding the 99. It was their job. It was their assignment. It was their duty. It was their to-do list. That's their job day in and day out. And what you do is you see these shepherds lay down the 99 things they got to do to chase after the one that's most important. They set a priority in their life. You might got a 99 thing to do this Christmas season. It might be a busy season for you. But are you willing to lie down your agenda, your plan, your to-do list to chase the one? Or are you so busy being a Martha that all you're doing is preparing and never, and never being in the presence? See, Mary sits at the feet of Jesus while Martha is preparing for Jesus. And these shepherds set an agenda for us. Leave the 99 things you got going on to chase the one. If you have not caught up with the one, you have not pursued hard enough. They don't wait till they are relieved. They don't wait for the next shepherds to come on their duty. They don't wait for reinforcements. 
well, my shift will be over in two and a half hours, and then I can go see Jesus. They just run. It says they hurry. And then when they get there and they see him, it says they go around and they tell everyone. So they drop everything they got going on to chase. Well, my question to you is this. Is your faith, is Jesus so real to you that you'll drop everything to run to where he is? Or is Jesus just the thing you do as long as you got everything else off your list? Look, I, I understand this. This message hits home for me because this month we've had the busiest two months. I, I took off traveling. At the end of the year, I felt like the Lord had told me to pause traveling and speaking, and I didn't know why, but all of a sudden we had to remodel uh, the houses that we've moved out of, and, and, and it was this big thing, and so I've been uh, pulling double duty, and, and my wife even more so than me, uh, as full-time uh, pastors and full-time construction workers and it's been busy and and hard and all of a sudden I felt the weight of being so busy that just stopping and soaking was difficult so I got out of my uh, bubble my pastor bubble for a minute and I'm like man there are times in your life that you have to be purposeful you have to be intentional or life will get so busy that it swallows up your worship it will suck up your time. And you'll say, Jesus, I, I really want to spend time with you, but you don't understand. They just called. It's an emergency. I got to go right now. I got to get that done. Look, I get it. I, we were so busy this month that I was like, shower? Who has time for a shower? You just run through sprinklers as you're trying to get to the car. You're good. You're good. I just, I just ran through the car wash and just, you know, that was it. Two minutes and out. Boom, done. It works, guys. <laughs> they chased me straight out of there for some reason they didn't like that I don't know why it was fine it was fine I had my speedo on it was fine we're going to ignore that comment <laughs> oh my goodness you know, what's funny is I'm looking down at my notes. I don't even have to ask who that is. I know exactly who said it. <laughs> Everyone online is like, what do he say? Can't repeat it. <laughs> we in church. <laughs> These shepherds have uncovered something that I think is crucial for where God has taken you in this season. Next week, we're going to talk about where are we headed, but the point is you got to be headed somewhere. There are so many of us that have no direction. I talked about it last week about the aimlessness that brings anxiety, that when you are aimless, when you have nowhere to go and you are not pointed somewhere, you will build up anxiety, frustration, hurt, pain. The problem is, is sometimes we get too busy, but sometimes we're so, we have such a lack of busyness that we have a lot of time to do our own thinking. And the problem is that our thinking is usually not the right kind of thinking. And your lack of assignment or busyness will get you in a place where the enemy has your ear too often. Whoa, he's a chatty Kathy. You ever recognize that successful people don't sit around and chat a whole bunch? But people that got nothing going on just want to use up all your time? They want to tell you every bit of the story and you're like, I don't, need, I don't know your aunt. I don't know why you're telling me about this story. Tell me I'm not t telling the truth, right? I'm going to talk. When I retire, I'm going to talk to you guys so much about nothing. <laughs> I'm never going to retire, so it's never going to happen. But I'm still going to talk to you so much, but just about stuff that's not nothing. Just stuff that's about something. All right, but... What happens is, is that we need to be busy or we'll end up aimless because you were created to have purpose. You were created to be pointed somewhere. And you see these shepherds, they're busy doing the work they're called to do. Can I say something to you? When Elijah shows up, he finds Elisha on the plow. When the 
Angels show up, they find the shepherds guarding the sheep. In fact, if I go through the whole Bible, what you will find is a consistent thing is that when God shows up to use somebody, he never shows up and uses somebody that's doing nothing. He always finds someone in the middle of something and tells them to do something else. He calls them to something because they are people who will do it. God is not looking for the best. He's just looking for those that will do it. He's looking for a yes, not the best. God, I don't know what you want to do. Get busy doing something. The shepherds are doing something, and God says, I got something else for you to do now. Now, I want you to go down there, and instead of taking care of the sheep, I want you to go see the lamb of the world. The lamb that comes into the world to take away the sin of the world. I got a different sheep for you to see tonight. Because we were created to have purpose. We were created to worship. See, this is, this is so interesting to me about the idea of creation. That all of creation was meant to worship God. Not just people, but all of creation. You know, the word says that if we don't worship him, the rocks will cry out. That we have God's heart and desire from him to worship him. But if we don't worship, something has to. We are created. All of creation is meant to make sure worship is happening to God. That if we don't do it, something else will get in the place of that. We are created to worship, and I find this interesting when we hear about it because I think we picture Silent Night a little differently than what it's supposed to be. We see this, and we see the little angels, and it's like they come out, and we picture these gorgeous little angels in their fluffy white dresses or whatever, right, with golden little wings, and they're like, oh, glory to God in the highest peace. Shh, it's a silent night. Hey, guys. We don't want to wake him. He's swaddled right now. But there's a beautiful little baby. Oh, he's so cute. This is what we picture, I think. And some of you are laughing. You're like, yeah, that's true. We think of this like, oh, you know, like, like this glorious kind of peaceful moment. And it's not until we get into the book of Revelation and we see John kind of seeing the entire scene of Jesus' birth. I, some of you are today years old when you found out that Revelation actually covers the birth of Jesus. But what happens in Revelation, I'm a firm believer of this, is that what happens in Revelation is actually God peeling back time and giving John a revelation of what was happening from a heavenly perspective. Yes, there are future events. I'm not saying there's not. But the beginning of it is these moments that have already passed, the moments of Jesus' birth. The moments of Mary fleeing with the baby into Egypt. And we see it from a heavenly perspective, not the earth perspective. The earth perspective is angels show up and they say, peace on earth. But there's war in heaven. When we look at Revelation, we see a war is going on. Because it seems kind of interesting that a bunch of angel armies show up. It doesn't say the heavenly choir showed up. It says armies showed up it doesn't even say army it says armies in the plural it means some of you maybe your thing says heavenly hosts that's what they are but this is angel armies that show up and say peace on earth they're not saying we're hopeful and it's just a peaceful night they're saying we're warring for peace on earth We have showed up here to begin the assault, to take back the dominion that was taken in the garden and return it to man. This is good news. We've started a war and we're bringing peace to the earth and we showed up. So go see this baby that's going to grow up and be a conquering king and bring heaven back to earth. It was an act and declaration of war and the shepherds ran like to the streets saying, hey, The heavenlies are coming. The angels are coming. The king is coming. It's our first Paul Revere. They're declaring war has begun. The promise of a king, a conquering king. And the angel army saying we're ready. And these angels worship God. And they give the news to the shepherds, and the shepherds leave everything. And they run to worship that baby in a manger. See, 
it gives us the first clue that it's not worship, it's worship. It's an act of war when we worship. When we declare that God is good, what we are doing is indicting evil. When we declare that God wins, we're set telling the devil he loses. When we declare that God, you are first, we are saying, devil, you have no place. When we declare that we worship God alone, we're telling the enemy, you don't have any place in my heart. And we're evicting the enemy. We're driving back the forces and we're beginning to move. Christmas, the birth of Jesus, is a declaration of worship. How do I know about this worship? Second Samuel tells us in 22 4, it says this I call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised, and I am saved from my enemies. There is something about calling on the Lord and praising God that drives the enemy away. And you initiate the advancement. You are meant to run towards something. Where are you at and what are you running towards? Are you just going through the motions of sitting still? Or are you chasing Jesus in your life? See, some of you might be baby Christians and some of you might be still worshiping the baby Jesus. Some of you, you have faith and you love God, but your, your God is still a baby in a manger. What does that mean? Well, how is my baby in a manger? See, Jesus is still worthy to be worshipped when he's in the manger, but it's not till he's a man that he can break us free from sin. It's not until he's a man that he can set us free and heal us. He doesn't heal as a baby, he heals as a man. He sets you free as a man. Some of us love Jesus and we worship God, but we don't serve a God that we allow to be the man of our lives and heal us, set us free and break chains. What Jesus are you worship? I worship, I worship real hard, but you don't allow him to be the grown-up Jesus of your life and have authority and control. You're still trying to manage Jesus. Some of, the, some of you, that's your faith. It's let me see if I can just get Jesus to do what I want. I got an agenda today, little Jesus. Come on, let's go. Where are we going? I got to go to the temple. Come on. Okay, now it's time to go home. Where's Jesus? I lost Jesus. Jesus isn't lost. You are. He didn't leave you. You left him. He's right where he was supposed to be. See, some of you need to recognize that Jesus is not meant to follow you. You're meant to follow him. You need to be like the shepherds and start chasing Jesus. We were created to worship. Here's the reality. When you are created to worship, you will always instinctually, it is built into you to worship something. If you don't worship the divinity, you'll worship humanity. You will worship your job. You will worship money. You will worship other people. You will worship something other than the living God. You were created to worship. It's why the Bible says, you shall have no other gods before me because God understood it is the nature of man to worship and they better worship me. But the problem is, is when we get out of the right perspective and we begin to worship other gods like our jobs, like our families, we put other things before him. Should we be good to our family? Should we have family time? Absolutely. Absolutely. We don't worship it. We only worship the living God and we get out of order sometimes. We are created to worship. When you don't worship the celestial king, you'll worship a celebrity leader. Oh, I'm telling on myself right now. When you don't worship a heavenly king, you'll idolize a celebrity pastor. See, you're Christian. Some of you, some of you, some of you came in here. You're like, I don't, I don't idolize no pastor. I don't even want to be here. Mom made me come. I get it, I get it, and we thank you for the two two furs a year. I don't want to be here. They made me come. That's okay. So, but you worship something. I promise you worship something. You're following somebody. You look up to somebody. You see, I have a, I have a, a very interesting childhood. I grew up with a. Jewish father who did not practice Judaism. He's 100% Jewish by race, right? My mom, who is not 
Jew, she doesn't have Jewish ethnicity. She was the one chasing Judaism. So I grew up in Judaism, but my father um, follows Eastern gurus. When I grew up, he'd follow a guru, Guru Maharaji, and he would say, he's the Jesus of this generation. Every generation has one, and Jesus is just one of, and he's the Jesus. And I told him, I said, well, that's really weird because there's like 15 more popular gurus than him. On the totem pole of followers, he's pretty darn low. <gasps> and, and what I would notice is my father would reject Jesus. He would reject the living God of his ancestors of his fathers. He rejected that one. But when he wouldn't try to idolize this man, he would idolize his friends. Uh, if you've ever talked to my dad, you know he, his friend is the smartest person you've ever met, and they're the most brilliant and they're the best and the most successful. When he talks about people and he talks about things, everything is the greatest it's ever been. He can't help but worship what he's around because he doesn't worship who's around him. And so no matter what, I've watched my father just worship everything around him. And men would let him down and it would crush him because it turned out they weren't God. But he wouldn't surrender to the real God. And so I saw it my whole life that no matter what, he had to worship something. And I watch people all the time. They're always worried. I don't care. Someone says, well, I'm an atheist. I don't believe in nothing. You ever notice how passionate athe atheists are to proselytize people, to preach to them, to convert them to atheism? They worship that. They spend all, you ever, you ever been on, uh, uh, you know, uh, social media and you see people that are constantly talking about how there is no God, like it's their life's mission. They worship that identity. They worship nothing as a, as a something, which doesn't make any sense if it's nothing. I heard that say, you can prove God real quick. That they think we're crazy because we say that God created everything. And that seems far-fetched. And we asked them, well, what do you believe? They said nothing. So you believe nothing created something. But we're crazy. And so what happens when you die? Well, we go back to nothing. So you return to your creator? Sounds like faith. <laughs> so we're created to worship no matter what. There's something instinctually in us. And if we don't worship the living God, we don't put him right in your life. I don't care where your faith level is in this room. Understand, you're worshiping something. And if God's not the number one thing you're worshiping, you have to ask yourself, what am I worshiping? What am I giving away that's meant for God, that's occupying my life and taking me in the wrong direction that's going to lead me to heartache? Because God's plan for me is better, and he said I should worship him and him alone, that his plans for me are to prosper me and not to harm me. I don't know how to tell you this, but you might think in your own head, well, my plans for my life are not to harm me either. Would anybody agree with that? I don't have any plans to harm me. Some of you are like, no, no, I'm, that's in my, that's in my, I'm going to do that later on. There's that one person I'm ticked off. I'm going to say it and it's going to get me in a lot of trouble. I'm going to do it anyways. But for the majority of us, we have no intention of making plans to hurt our lives. We're not planning for that. But somehow yet we do things and we're like, well, man, that was not my intention. Any of you ever been there like me? You did something and you're like, well, that didn't work out the way I thought it was going to. That was not my intention. It turns out we are smart, but we're just not quite smart enough to know how our plans are going to affect us. And so when you don't worship God, sometimes you worship you. And everything is about your self-help. I will help me and myself alone. But when we call upon the Lord, it says that he saves us from our enemy. When we worship God. This Christmas, this season, where we're celebrating the greatest gift of all. Where we're celebrating the gift of Jesus. You know, I think about those magis and they come and they bring gifts to Jesus. Jesus. And they come and present them because they don't just travel from a field nearby. They travel across countries. 
in caravans and bring treasures to the king. They looked up in the heavens and they got a sign that something was happening and they dropped what they were doing and they changed direction and they chased down so that they could be a witness to what God is doing. There are so many of you, you're like, look, I, I, don't, I, I don't need to be at church. I can worship God at home. Absolutely. It says the shepherds went back to the field and they continued to praise God, but they didn't stay there to do it. They could have had those angel armies show up and declare it to them, and they could have just fell on their face and worshiped from there, celebrating it. But they had an opportunity to encounter God, not just worship him. Are you just worshiping him or are you encountering Encountering him. If there's somewhere you can encounter, you should be where the encounter is happening. If there's somewhere where God is moving, I want to be where he's moving. I want to worship him all the time. I want to worship him when I'm busy and I'm taking care of my 99, but I don't want to ever just stay there. I want to pursue him. He's the one. And there's nothing that will get me out of his presence when it's there. There is no clock. There is no agenda. When he shows up in the room, nothing else matters. The sheep are on their own. Well, I've got a one o'clock up counseling appointment. Nope. He showed up. The sheep are on their own. Here's the beautiful thing is that those shepherds, they did something amazing. They never once said, I hope the sheep are okay. Why? Because there was angel armies there. They probably felt like, you know, I think, I think maybe the sheep will make it. There are a whole lot of angels. I, I wonder if they said, hey, you guys stay here. We're going to go see baby Jesus. We're going to go see him. So they chase him down. And they never wondered because they trusted God that God would provide as they pursued. Do you trust God this morning that he'll provide as you pursue? Or do you hold back from pursuing God because you feel like it was going to cost you too much and you don't trust that the cost is worth it? Here's where I want to say, you've, you've been given the greatest gift. We talked about children trying to sit still earlier under the tree, waiting to open presents. But I think about that idea that you've been given the greatest gift. And Rabbi Shoshana was talking to me this morning about giving the greatest gift. Uh, the problem is, is that Jesus came. He gave you the greatest gift. And some of you, just like the Christmas present, you're going to go home and you're staring at that Christmas present. But it doesn't do you any good until you've unwrapped it. So some of you have the greatest gift, but you have not unwrapped it. It's still sitting there. It's yours. It is not Unwrapped. Some of you, your faith is still a baby swaddling in cloth and you've never unwrapped him and allowed him to grow up. He is still worthy of your worship, but you have not unwrapped. You have not taken ownership. You have not held on to that and allowed him to be the thing that you are pursuing and praising. The way you worship matters because it's your worship. And this Christmas season, what I'm asking you to do is change your perspective and be the kind of person that's like, mm-hmm, 99, I'm all about leaving them. Does that challenge some of you when I say that? I can see it on your face. You're like, no, no, I, got, I can't. I didn't say just to abandon people. I said pursue the Lord, and there is a difference. Here's the reality. Those people you love should be coming with you. Do you think that Jesus abandoned his mom in the temple when she lost Jesus? Can you imagine that, by the way? We're talking about Christmas. Your daily prayers, you're like, Lord, Father, lost your son. I know you entrusted me to take care of the whole universe, but yeah, I misplaced him. For three days. I find it interesting that as he starts to become, you know, he's 12. He's about to become a, a Jewish man. He's about to become a Jewish man. On the eve, whew, this is a good revelation right here. On the eve of him becoming a Jewish man at 13, he's 12 and they're testing him. 
on the eve of him becoming a Jewish man, he's lost for three days, and then he steps into his manhood. And on the eve of him becoming God, your Savior, and resurrecting, he's lost for three days, and then he steps into his divinity. Some of you have misplaced him in your life because you have not pursued him completely. Where is his place? Where is your place? What are you worshiping? What are you pursuing? So as we step into this Christmas season and this next year, I hope that our plan is to ask the Lord, what is it? we need to let go of to chase you and who is it we need to make sure comes with us and not leave behind the shepherds all went together it says they all it says the shepherds not shepherd they didn't leave anybody behind as they went to worship God and here's the thing I don't think anyone would have stayed behind if they were asked to because when you've had a radical encounter with God it will instantly get your feet to move I can always tell who's had a radical encounter with God with the way you worship. I I promise you. I can look around on a Sunday morning and be like, not yet, not yet, not yet, doesn't want to. Based on the way you respond. When you've encountered the glory of God, it changes your movements. You'll run into Bethlehem and leave the sheep because the glory of heaven has come down. But if you sit stagnant, it tells me you have not had an encounter, at least not today. Or it's grown stale. I believe that God gives us these encounters. I I believe that's why it's so important, and I'm closing right here. I believe that it's so important for us to chase the encounter of God. And then when there's an opportunity for an encounter of God, we don't miss it. Because I believe those are moments that shake us up that set us running forward, that change our direction and send us into the purpose we were called to. Can you imagine, can you imagine the story being reversed and they were like, yeah, we got the message, but we had to take care of the sheep. We never actually saw them. We got the invite, but we had to decline because we had other priorities. So this Christmas... It's a family time. Yes, you're going to gather with your family. You're going to open presents. You're going to do all that. But don't forget about the one that came for you that made this season possible. And the reason why we celebrate this season, oh, there's lots of people, there's lots of Christians out there with lots of perspectives. I don't have time to get into all of the the roots of Christmas. We're not doing that this morning. We can do it at another time if you're interested in that conversation. But this morning what I want to do is just change your direction a bit and point you somewhere. And get you pointed like the shepherds. Are you willing to leave your to-do list to worship Jesus? Would you bow your heads with me? Father, thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for your presence. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that that you're here in this room, that the Spirit of Jesus that was sent into the world is here with us this morning. That you are gathered here in this room, Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that we are not alone. That we have hope. And that shalom, peace, can enter our worlds where we can live at peace. Because you have came to war. Thank you, Lord, that we can live at peace. Because you're here. Thank you, Lord, that you change our direction and you want to encounter us and you want us to encounter you. Thank you, Lord, that you're the God who doesn't just ask man to pursue you, but because man wasn't pursuing, you showed up. You pursued us. Thank you, Lord, that you came into the world with an agenda to save us so that we could let go of our agendas. Thank you, Lord, that your goodness and your mercy were birthed on that day 
in reality. That you give us the opportunity to unwrap goodness, to unwrap mercy, to unwrap hope in our life. That when we allow ourselves to be wrapped up in our own lives, we miss you. But when we're wrapped up in you, God, we can pursue you. There are some of you this morning that this Christmas, your gift is a revelation of Jesus' love. Is a revelation that he wants you to pursue him. That he's asking you to give up your agenda and pursue him. And that's the greatest gift you could get in your life. I'm not asking you to give up anything. I'm asking you to pick up everything. That the other side of this pursuit is peace, joy, hope. It doesn't guarantee you no suffering. It doesn't guarantee you no problems. It's not a fix-all. It's a hope-all. It's an assurance. Some of you need to get out of the field and run towards Jesus. I don't know who I'm talking to this morning. Something Jesus never said, by the way. See, because he knows exactly who he's talking to. And he knows who he's talking to you this morning, and I do too. There are some of you this morning here that need this word, that need that hope in your life, that realize there are angel armies beckoning you, challenging you to chase Jesus. And those angel armies are there for you, for your victory. You were made for victory. God made you to win. Some of you have not been winning because you've been in the wrong place where the battle is not winning. Some of you this morning, you would say this, before I want to give a word about changing direction, and I believe I have some words for some of you, about changing directions and pursuing God differently. But some of you, you've been so busy with your own plan in your own life that you haven't made room for the worship of Jesus. You haven't chased him down because you don't have a relationship with him. You're not the shepherd that got the word because you're not his. And this morning you're like, I need to give my life to Jesus. Or maybe you've given your life to Jesus but you have not been following him at all. You have not been pursuing him and you can't say that you're walking with God at all. I want that encounter but I don't even have a relationship with him to have it. And this morning you say, I want to make this Jesus the king of my life. I want to surrender. I want him to forgive me of my sins. I want him to wash me clean. I want to enter a relationship with him. I want to make that bold step, that choice, that either for the first time or, or because I have not lived that life, I've walked away. And this morning, whether you're online watching on Facebook or Zoom or in the room, I want you to ask that honest question. If there's someone here, I want to give you that opportunity. I'm going to pray for the rest of you in a moment. but just want to give that opportunity that this morning you're like my plan is not working maybe I should pursue him and give my life to him it's look we use our own vernacular as we invite Jesus into our heart but really what we're doing is we're making him the Lord of our life and we're giving up we're giving up our 99 our agenda our plan are 99 different plans for what our life has to look like because we recognize he's the king of kings and he needs to be my king. So this morning, if that's you, I just want to ask you, if you're feeling that and you're like, yeah, that's kind of me, then I want you to make the crazy bold step of something so simple as raising your hand when I ask you to. Come on. So right now, if that's for you, raise your hand up high and say, that's me. Amen. Amen. Anybody else? If you're online, just say, yes, Jesus. Amen. If you're online, just type, yes, Jesus, and that's your hand raise. Thank you, Lord. So right now, for those that have raised their hand this morning, for those that are saying yes online, I want to give you that opportunity. We're going to pray with you. And some of you that didn't raise your hand, you still need to pray. Oh, 
would come back into alignment with the Lord. And then we're going to pray for all of us that need to be pursuing, that we're, we're believers, we're Christians, we're saved. He's our king. We haven't been pursuing properly, but let's pray, Father, this, for those that need this, say, Heavenly Father, thank you for sending your son, Jesus, who was born to die for me, that he rose from the dead. He did not stay buried, but he rose to conquer death to give me the gift of life. I accept that free gift. I ask you to wash me clean. Forgive me of my sin. Every wrong thing I've done, forgive me. And I commit my life to you. I belong to you. I commit myself as a child of God. You're my king. From now until my last breath, I belong to you. In the name of Jesus, hallelujah, amen. Now for you guys, that this word pierced your heart and you said, there have been some things that I've allowed to distract me from the one that I'm supposed to have my gaze upon. See, the shepherds in the fields of Bethlehem, you know what sheep they were raising? Most likely they're raising sacrificial lambs. That was their job, temple sacrifices in those fields. So some of us, even our busy can be for him, but it's not directed to him. It's not with him. So if this morning, I don't care what your busy looks like. I don't care what your agenda looks like. I don't care what your 99. You just realize I need to be pointed a different direction. I want to be pointed a different direction. I want to be able to pursue God and I have not pursued him like the shepherds pursued him. And I want to have that kind of pursuit where I just drop it and run. And this morning you're saying, that's me. You're convicting my heart. Would you raise your hand so I can pray with you? Come on. Come on. Just say, that's me online if that's for you. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. For those that would say, God, I'm going to be pointed a different direction. Those hands raised are a commitment saying, I don't want to be pointed at my plan anymore. I want my life to look different. I want angel armies to show up and point me a different direction so I can finally win. Not my victory, your victory. So Father, right now in the name of Jesus, I just declare that every enemy, I feel this very strongly. There are some of you that just need to begin, as I pray over you, you need to begin to worship the living God. You need to worship the living God as I pray over you. You can do that however you want. You are not, uh, you, you don't have to sit still. You don't have to get up. You don't have to stay there. You can do what you want, but it better be worship. Don't say, God, I'll go, but you won't do anything. Your movement remains the same. I don't care if you're just bowing your head or you're running around the room. Do what you want but I'm giving you freedom right now but I feel like the Lord is moving on you right now to move you so father right now in the name of Jesus I just declare that those that would worship you in spirit and truth, those that would hunger and thirst after you, God, that you will encounter them and that angel armies will begin to break off every demonic warfare built against them. That the hope of Jesus, the light of the world, begins to enter them right now. And I declare right now that authority of heaven rests on their lives. Lord, that just like the authority of the angel army showed up to make a declaration that I declare over you right now that victory is coming into your life. Hope is coming into your life as you begin to pursue the God of hope, the God of victory, the God of peace. That victory is yours. And I declare no more sickness in your body, no more getting attacked constantly the season of assault is coming to an end right now some of you need that word it's been a season of assault on your life and I declare that ends right now every time you turn around it's like a hit after a hit and I declare right now Lord I won't remain in fields where there are no angel armies to guide me And I won't remain when the angel armies point me in a different direction. I'll pursue you and leave everything else behind that is not of you. I lay down my agenda right now. I lay it down and I celebrate your birth right now. And my celebration is an act of praising you. Celebration to Jesus is surrender to Jesus. 
it can't look like anything else. You can't say, well, I praised him, but you didn't surrender to him. You can't have one without the other. You cannot truly worship the living God until you are surrendered to him. Some of you need to worship in surrender. You can't just thank him for blessing your plan. That's not how it works. So, Father, we worship you. We adore you. We chase you. We pursue you. We want to run towards you. Lord, let us not be still, even on a silent night. Let us hurry to your feet. Let us not be people that dawdle that waffle, that hesitate, but let us be people of persistent pursuit for the presence of God. I just hear the Lord just saying, I'm breaking off some things out of people's lives this morning. You walked in here with a heavy heart. There's some of you right now, even though it's Christmas time, and there's some of us that Christmas is very hard, but this one's for a different person, not not the one that Christmas is always hard for, but I felt like there was somebody that walked in this room this morning, and this particular year, it's just felt like, gosh, can we get through this because it's just been a few couple of weeks. Like, everything has just been a um, war. And it doesn't feel like victorious war. I understand that. I understand that. But it feels like it's just been one thing after another. And I hear the Lord just say, I'm not sure who this is for, but I I hear the Lord just say, um, it's time to have peace in my presence as you pursue me this morning. I'm breaking off the attack that's on your life. See, the enemy has been afraid of you hearing this message this morning. That even when I spoke this, this is for someone that you are going through a few weeks. When I spoke this message, it's like you dare to hope again. I don't know if someone wants to claim that word. You can raise your hand if that's for you. I just want to pray for you. Amen. Amen. There's a couple of hands in here. Amen. We serve a good God who has good plans. Sometimes in the middle of the plan, it doesn't always feel good. The plan to get to a promise deals with deserts, and it doesn't always feel good in the middle, but the end is always good. So, Father, I declare right now that you're bringing victory, that it's your season of hope. It's your season to break the audacity of the enemy to come and lie and discourage. So right now, everything that would discourage from hope, I break that off in the name of Jesus. I break that off in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. We want to pray for you. Send us a message with your prayer requests through Facebook or email and let us know how we can pray for you today. Also, let us know how this message impacted your life. I love you. God loves you. Shalom. 